it's a pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon and uh, to welcome all of you to uh, the Texana room of the Tagalog Library. We're now located on the third floor, but we still have claims to this, this room. It's one of our favorites. It's great for meetings and lectures. Uh, notice some of the signs of Texas. What does Texas have in common with Vikings? Maybe quite a bit, actually. We're, we're fairly predatory. Uh, this is the largest uh, known map of Dallas. Uh, and uh, Bonnie was asking me earlier, where is SMU? Well, we're, we are off the map, uh, but we're about where, if you see where 1891 is, and then there's a, a diagonal lines below, that's the Houston and Texas Central and the uh, Katy Railroad crossing. Uh, and so just a bit of, above that is where the SMU campus was to be. And then around the room, you'll see some replicas of Texas flags. And then beaming down upon us is Sam Houston himself with a, an overlooking his shoulder is a portrait of Andrew Jackson and uh, so uh, Houston. And then around the, uh, the, on the shelves, it's a new ac uh, acquisition for us. We have on the back wall, some uh, examples of uh, American uh, leather trade bindings. So these are all leather bound uh, American books starting in the 1780s through the 19th century. And then starting in this corner, uh, cloth bound, but publishers cloth bindings. And you see it becomes gaudy as a uh, peacock as the uh, uh, bindings move around the, the, uh, the room. So anyway, this is uh, glad to have you here. Special privilege for us and uh, welcome both the Grundy family and all of you. And since we're sort of double, triple, quadruple, whatever it is, by a hundred uh, privilege this afternoon, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the person who's going to introduce our speaker, uh, and that is Dorsey Armstrong, who's chair of the English department. Oh, wait, just a second before we begin that, uh, Pamela Grundy wishes to speak. Pamela, who is the sister of Stefan, the person who really took charge of organizing this event. Thank you, Pamela. Yes, I just wanted on, on behalf of the Grundy family to say that we're so delighted to be here and to thank all of you for being here uh, to the inaugural Stefan Grundy lecture, particularly to Bonnie, who, who made the arrangements. We arranged the creation of the of the endowment, but Bonnie ordered the Viking food and observed the Roman and, and, and got all of, all of y'all to come. And we, she was such a wonderful mentor to Stefan when he was here. And it's wonderful to have her at this, at this stage as well. Um, I wanna say thanks also to the SMU administration who made the process of creating this endowment um, run so very smoothly. And to all the friends and colleagues and family members who have contributed to the endowment fund, fund to, to Stefan's fund. We appreciate that so much. Um, my brother's passing was of course a great shock to all of us. He was just 54. Now he had been talking and reading since he was six months old as I, his oldest sister, can attest to. Uh, and he had extraordinary mind, as you've already said. Uh, and in his too short life, he did extraordinary things. But we know we, he also had a lot of words left in him at 54. And, um, and, and it's, it's, it's a sad. Uh, but it does mean a great deal to us to have him remember here at SMU, especially as part of the Medieval Studies program. Uh, he was happy here, uh, striding around campus in his robes and his bare feet, focusing on the era and the literature that he loved, working with people who really cared about him. That's something very special about this institution. Um, his interest took him far from Texas, first to Cambridge, where he got his PhD, and then eventually to Ireland, where he and his wife Melody settled, and he lived out the rest of his life. But much of what he did over there, his studies, his art, his gardening, his writing, had its roots here. Uh, it was at SMU that he moved from enthusiast to scholar. 
We hope as a family that now and in the coming years, the ideas and inspirations that the Stefan Grundy lectures bring to campus, starting with Professor Hughes, we're very excited about that. Um, we hope they will excite and encourage new generations of students who have their own journeys ahead of them. Thank you. Uh, we have a few people who are going to be here today. Is, it, is anybody else here who remembers Stefan as a student? Uh, Joe, can you say a couple of words about Stefan as a student? Is some, oh, how you knew him? This is Joe Goyne, professor of English. Um, he and I were students together. I was a graduate student. Um, he, was, he was very much a character. He was charming. He looks very much like his sister. And uh, uh, we were not close friends, but we had classes together, and it was very, it was very much fun uh, discussing the things that uh, came up in those classes and his take on it, and uh, how enthusiastic. I mean, he had all this, you know, all the makings when I knew it uh, of a scholar, and uh, I actually have a rhyme book at home, so I, and I bought it when it first came out. So uh, I'm very uh, Happy to see that he can do this lecture. So much. Thank you. His, his, yes, thank you. His sister encapsulated the Stefan meeting. By the way, several of you here are, are veterans or soon to be veterans of the Pilgrimage course. Raise your hands if you, if you are. Yes, I see. Hand up high. That's it. Uh, enthusiast. Uh, and Stefan was one of the earliest. Uh, members of that of that course when we first had it. It was wonderful that you are now taking a course and think about your future lives as scholars and, and writers. That'll be the next thing I'm going to be asking of each of you. When he was an undergraduate, it was fascinating to see his development as someone thinking about Viking and Northern literatures because he was always involved in myth and, uh, and the relations between myth and history. He didn't confuse them. Uh, he was very clear about uh, the things that were that you could demonstrate in the scholarly level and things that you had to impute, things you had to uh, learn how to develop out of an imagination uh, that you could see live uh, in ancient times, but not expressed in, uh, in the language that we are accustomed to thinking about things in, in scholarship. He was extraordinary, and uh, he had all of the scholarly knowledge that you could ask for. At the same time, he had this fabulous imagination and we'll be talking about that in a few minutes, I think. Uh, all of his books, and we're gonna be collecting all the ones we don't have, uh, will be in this library as part of the Degollier collection is something that we'll be able to hold on to forever. Uh, so I thank you all for being here. And now I'm gonna ask Dorothy Armstrong, who is the editor of this wonderful journal called Arthuriana, uh, for which some of you have been uh, victim gnomes, as we call our helpers uh, in the past. And, uh, and who is also the chair of the English department. Many of you may have seen uh, various things called the Great Courses, uh, anything on uh, by the, is it still called the teaching company? Uh, the Great Courses, huh? One three, it keeps rebranding. One three, oh, right there. Uh, and, and, and she's one of the most famous lecturers uh, in, that, in that great uh, series. And uh, so many of you may have seen her do things on Arthurian literature, even on, we don't do Vikings. Black Death. Black Death, that'll get you. Uh, okay, so we've been talking about Black Death today in the pilgrimage course, so uh, keep considering all the ways in which you can continue to enjoy the Middle Ages in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, here is Dorsey Armstrong to tell us about her colleague, Sean Hughes. Thank you, Bonnie, and thank you to everyone who's here. And having heard all these tributes to Stefan, I can't imagine a better person to be giving the inaugural lecture in the series. My senior colleague, Sean Hughes, um, is an expert in all things Icelandic, Old Norse, Viking, Tolkien. Uh, and usually when he is introduced, somebody thinks that they will make a, a joke and say, Sean has forgotten more things than any of us will ever know. But that would be incorrect because as we all realize, as we start to say that, he hasn't forgotten anything. Ever. Um, I'll give you one quick example and then I will turn the podium over to him. Uh, we were chatting uh, some time ago about 
a manuscript that he had discovered that had been mislabeled. He looked closely and he was able to identify that it was in fact a medieval manuscript that was a glossary half in Basque and half in Icelandic. And I said to him, I think there are probably only 12 people in the world who could do something with that manuscript. And he said, yes, and only 11 other people will care when I do it. <laughs> but uh, he is perfect for this inaugural lecture because above all, he is an amazing teacher and mentor. He has, you're in your hundredth semester teaching at Purdue, is that correct? Um, decades of students who still think of him as the most influential teacher they have ever had. And to this day, I will hear students come out of his Vikings class or his Tolkien class, and they're speaking so excitedly. Sometimes even some of them might text me from the class, which they shouldn't do, to tell me how amazing the experience of having Professor Hughes for a teacher is. So with that, I will finish my introduction and say that you're in for a treat. Um, Professor Sean Hughes speaking in the inaugural uh, Grundy Lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Lori, for that kind introduction. I must confess I shamefully stole this from the website. Uh, <coughs> We're here this afternoon to celebrate the work of Stephen Grundy, a gifted writer, and I do not use the term lightly, who received his Bachelor of Arts from this university. While he was still a first year student, he was inspired to write a novel on some great story from the Western heroic age. He initially intended to focus on Beowulf, whose story survives in an early 11th century manuscript, a poem of 3,182 lines, in his verse. But Dr. Stephen Flowers, who in 1986 had published his doctoral dissertation uh, on uh, runes and magic, magical formulaic elements in the elder, elder tradition, and who was a lecturer at the University of Texas at Austin, advised him, and very prudently, I might add, uh, not rather to devote his energies to retelling the story of the cursed horde of the dwarf Anvar associated with the River Rhine. The result was the 721 densely printed pages of Rheingold, which was first published in hardcover in 1994 by the venerable New York publishing house Doubleday under its phantom imprint. The final manuscript had taken a number of years to complete, including intense stints when Stephen was an international exchange student, first at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and then at the Rheinisch Friedrich Wilhelms Universität in Bonn, Germany. Even though the novel is published in one volume, it is in its own way a trilogy. This may be the reason why the first volume is dedicated to J.R.R. Tolkien, although The Lord of the Rings and Rheingold have very little in common outside of length. Uh, the first volume is also dedicated to Richard Wagner, although Das of Derin, Das Nibelungen, and Rheingold are worlds apart. To the best of my knowledge, I never met Stefan nor Stephen Flowers. But our paths crossed, in a sense, through mutual acquaintances. Stephen Flowers' major professor was FPC Polymer at the University of Texas at Austin. Two of my closest friends in graduate school joined the Germanic Languages Department there. And as a result, I got to know Polymer quite well. And he actually wrote me a little recommendation for the job I got at Purdue. I also got to see prominent scholar of Old Norse, Lee M. Hollander, walking to his office one morning from the Austin campus in his 91st year. I was a mere graduate student at the time, <clears throat> and I did not dare to disturb the thoughts of the great man. Among the other people the second volume is dedicated to is Svetlian Bentenson, uh, who founded the Alcatrua Pilar, the Society of Believers in the Icea, or pagan Scandinavian deities, and who served as his first chief priest to Alcatrua Pilar. I got to know Svetlian, <coughs> excuse me, Sapir, when I was in Iceland in 1989, sorry, 1980. But what we had in common was a love of the long traditional Icelandic poems called Rima, or rhymes, and the tunes to which they are chanted, rather than neo-paganism. Another name from the dedication page who I also knew quite well was that of Paul Bevere, 
I met him first at the second International Cider Conference in Reykjavik in 1973, when he was a lecturer at the University of St. Andrews, although Stefan, who completed a doctoral dissertation on Odin at Cambridge University in 1996, published in 2014, probably met him during this time when Paul was teaching there as a lecturer, a post he held till his retirement in 1999. Reindel is a novel set in the past, but I would argue it is not an historical novel. More than the past, it addresses the present, a reforging of, quote, the sword of the northern soul, quote, as the dedication puts it. In some ways, Stephen follows in the footsteps of the Scottish writer James McPherson, who in 16, 1761 published Fingal, an ancient epic, following it two years later with Tamora, an ancient epic poem, both of which he claimed were translated from ancient Gaelic works composed by Oisin, the son of Finn McCool or Fingal, as McPherson calls him, in the third century of our era. While, in fact, McPherson did rely on fragments of, of Gaelic poetry, but for the last several hundred years, not the third century, his prose renderings of the material was repatched in a contemporary idiom and appealed to contemporary sensibilities, with the result that the poems became extremely popular and influential, both in Great Britain and on the continent. And yet at the same time were extremely controversial because of McPherson's claims for their great antiquity, although those debates don't concern us here. Stephen too is composing a substantial narrative out of fragments, which purport to show what life was like on the east bank of the Rhine in the first half of the fifth century. But the novel's worldview and sentiments are to my mind, at least anyway, contemporary. Now, in 1993, uh, uh, the year before Rheingold came out, there appeared under the imprint of the Ring of Toth, Troth, a 700-page uh, neo-pagan handbook called The, the Troth. This book, edited by Kveldover Hagen Gundersen, otherwise Stephen Grandi, Grand is divided into two parts. The first sections, parts 1 to 24, cover history and then a detailed introduction to Panty and Paisia and Vanya and associated people such as the dwarves, elves, and giants, all of which is solidly grounded in the appropriate scholarship. Part two sections, uh, 25 to 60, deal with spiritual matters, an outline of daily and lifetime rituals, and concludes with a list of resources, especially books on Old Norse and Germanic literature and culture. The sections on spiritual matters and the daily and lifetime rituals are the work of creative imagination, because virtually nothing is known about these matters uh, in pre-Christian Europe. What sources we do have are recorded several hundred years after the, the triumph of Christianity and have no interest in portraying uh, uh, past practices in a positive light. However, it, exactly, it is exactly these aspects <coughs> uh, of Rheingold and likewise Stephen Grundy's Beowulf, the descriptions of the daily and seasonal rituals, the rituals of birth, marriage, and death, that contribute to the novel's extraordinary power. These aspects of life are presented as natural and normal as people go about their lives on the east bank of the Rhine, having a wary eye on Roman, a Roman power which controls the region of the West Bank, and keeping a wary eye on Christianity, which has already begun to make inroads across the river. McPherson had only snatches of poetry to work with. Stefan, at least, was able to uh, uh, engage two complete narratives with which he felt comfortable. The earliest surviving version of the story of Nibelungli, which survives in 37 manuscripts from the 13th century on. But for Stefan, that was unsatisfactory, as the heroic nature of the main characters had become, as he puts it, greatly diminished in favor of a courtly, romantic approach to the narrative. That left the old Icelandic Velsungasada, preserved in a manuscript from around about 1400, and in its present form, not from much earlier although partially based on poems of the poet Edda, some of which do go back to the 9th and 10th centuries. It's actually been argued that Wilson Vasada itself may have been meant in a, no more than just a, to serve as a prologue to the saga of Ragnar Lodbrok uh, and his sons, which it follows immediately, immediately after without any break in the manuscript. This is the Ragnar of the History Channel's popular series Vikings. But he was, uh, uh, but some medieval Icelanders were proud uh, proud of him, proud of this name, because many of them claim ancestry from, uh, from Ragnar. Um, and all the better, Ragnar's ancestry included Sigurd the Dragon Slayer. 
So Dos and Gustag was kind of an afterthought to the real business, which was the story of Ragnar Lodbrok. Anyway, um, there's also an epitome of the most important episodes in the story found in the Prosier of Snorri Sturluson, who died in 1241. Now, neither of these sources are anywhere near to being contemporary to the events they purport to describe. And over the generations, the narrative has been embellished with a considerable amount of extraneous material. But Stefan resists any temptation to create an original or authentic narrative, but instead follows his source material closely, even when it's being anachronistic, differing from it only in the order in which he presents events. The main outlines of the story are well known and have been retold on numerous occasions. But Stefan makes his version compelling by his skillful use of the technique of cognitive estrangement. He has constructed a world, an imaginary one, based on a pre existing story that is not meant to accurately depict uh, some ancient history, but rather to estrange the reader from their quotidian existence, to challenge their unexamined assumptions and the everyday things they take for granted as normal. And uh, in doing so, uh, to turn from the so-called normal world, uh, sorry, in doing so, to turn the so-called normal world upside down by contrasting it with another world. It sets out to make the familiar seem unfamiliar and the unfamiliar seem familiar. We've already mentioned the way in which the public and private rituals of uh, daily life in the pre-Christian society have been integrated into the narratives as if they were self-evident. A fictionalized presentation of those rituals already available in the Book of Toth, Troth, if anyone was interested in pursuing these matters further. While we have never encountered this way of life before, the narrative presents it as if it is self evident. But at the same time, he makes the unfamiliar, uh, at the same time as he makes the unfamiliar familiar, he makes the familiar unfamiliar. This is particularly noticeable in the way in which he handles the names of the characters. So while some names remain unchanged and uh, changed and familiar, like Attila, uh, Sigurd's horse Grani, uh, his mother-in-law Grimhild, and various others, some of the most important names look very different. Gundahari for Gunnar, Sigifrith for Sigurd, Sigigaira for Sige. These variants seem to be modeled on Old High German, so maybe the idea is to make the names more suitable for the region in which the action has been set and to deflect from the purely Scandinavian version of the story being used. But it's also a kind of Fremdoms effect, which prevents the reader from getting too comfortable with the text, because it's not clear if this Sigifrit is going to behave in exactly the same way as the Sigifrit the reader is used to. As I mentioned earlier, the novel is in effect divided into three volumes. The first part is called The Draft of Memory, and it deals with mythic time and how it was that the gold of the uh, Rhine came into the possession of humans and the most, immediately the most immediate consequences of this unfortunate happening. The divinities Woden, Einir, and Loki are walking in the world. Loki sees an otter eating a salmon. And then the spirit of Gloucester's outcry in Act 4 of King Lear, as flies to wanton boys, so we to the gods, they kill us for this sport. For no good reason, he throws a stone at the otter, killing it and claiming both it, uh, uh, it claiming both its pelt and the salmon. Very pleased with himself. They spend the evening at the house of a man called Reymar, Reymar and his two sons, Fadmir and Rag. And Loki boasts of his afternoon prowess, it shows them the otter speak. Reidmar recognizes this as the pelt of his shape-shifting son, Otto. In compensation, he demands, quote, let his pelt be filled with gold to match the worth of his body to me. As always, if he felt the law, he would cause the problem in the first place to fix it. He learns that a dwarf, Antvari, has a vast treasure in the Rhine. Loki captures the dwarf and forces him to hand over his treasure, including his magic ring. Antvari curses the treasure that is thus forcibly taken from him. The gold is sufficient to cover the pelt, except for one whisker, and Anvari's ring must be sacrificed to cover it. This done, Woden, Hainia, and Loki are able to go on their way. But it's not long before the curse begins to 
uh, 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 occurs placed on the treasure begins to manifest itself. So Raidamad claims the treasure for himself and his surviving sons kill him and, and take it up into a cave in the mountain. Then Father Mir, the eldest son, eldest son refuses to share the treasure with his younger brother and guards the gold with such intensity that he turns into a dragon. Ragan apprentices himself to a dwarf smith and learns the craft, turning into a dwarf himself as the generations roll on. And he never gives up the hope that uh, the Rhine gold will one day be his. Five generations later, Ragan finds himself tutor to his eldest sister's great 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 grandson whose name is Siegfried. But that's the subject of the second volume, the second section. The section of the Otter's Ransom is based on information provided in chapter 14 of Vilsimba Saga. Part one now turns back to the beginning of that saga to recount events associated with Siegfried's uh, paternal line. This part of the story has obviously gone through many uh, uh, renderings, but I just want to point out two segments which are obviously not part of the original story, even if we could determine what that original story was. Siegfried's grandfather, Wals, had a great hall south of the river Elbe in northern Germany. In the middle of the hall is a massive ancient apple tree called the Bahnstock. Wals holds a great feast to celebrate the marriage of his daughter, Siegfried, Sigelin, that is Signy, to King Sigigir, king of the Yeas. Oh, by the way, that's Loki and Anbari. I forgot about that. Sansom. During the festivities, a tall barefooted man with one eye wearing a mottled blue cloak comes into the hall and stabs a great sword into the trunk of Barnstock. I give this sword as a gift to the man who can draw it, the man said before turning and leaving without further word. Now, if this motif seems familiar to you, uh, uh, so it should. It's first found in Robert de Bruyne's Merlin from around 1200, in which Arthur obtains the British throne by pulling a stone from an anvil sitting on top of a stone that appeared in a churchyard one Christmas Eve. The episode went on then to become a standby of the Arthurian corpus. Verse of the saga is late enough for the motif to have entered the northern storytelling uh, world several generations earlier to be adapted to local conditions. The bottom line is it's very unlikely that this story is in any way Germanic, uh, because I think it comes from the Allens way out on the steps, but that's, that's another whole matter. Uh, but Stefan did not shrink from making it part of his narrative of, of his Germanic world. And, and it's important because King Sigurd tries to draw the sword and fails. But Sigurd's twin brother Sigmund draws the sword with ease. King Sigurd asks Sigmund to give him the sword, but Sigmund refuses. And Sigurd leaves the feast abruptly the next day. Consequence of all this is that Sigurd uh, seeks revenge for this perceived slight and manages to kill King Vals and eight of his nine sons. Only Sigmund escapes, and Sigilin, he and Sigilin plot how they will be able to avenge the death of their father and siblings. Sigilin's children with Sigurd prove not to have the metal for the task, so Sigilin in disguise sleeps with her brother and gives birth to a son, Sinfjotli, who seems to have the requisite determination they're looking for. As part of a toughening up procedure, Sigmund takes Sinfjotli to the woods where they roam as werewolves. One day, in a fit of annoyance, that's something the young man had done. Sigmund bites Sinfjotli badly in the windpipe. And we saw uh, the Northman yesterday, and there's a kind of uh, such things that a very fine windpipe, windpipe biting sequence in that mood. <laughs> um, so, anyway, so Sinfjotli lies badly wounded for several days. Sigmund is in despair. One day he sees two weasels. As he watches them, one bites the other in the throat. Then it scurries away and comes back after some time with a leaf in its mouth. It places the leaf on its companion's throat and the wounded weasel immediately is cured and the animals run off together. A raven brings Sigmund a leaf just like the one the weasel has. And with this, Sigmund is able to cure the young man and they, bear, and they burn their wolf skins. Now let's go back to the Anglo-Norman poem Eliduk 
composed by Marie de France, late in the 12th century. Elduc, after a period of exile, returns to his wife, Guildeluic. He soon re she soon realizes that his mind is elsewhere and follows one day as he's visiting a chapel in which the body of uh, Guiliadon, the woman he's been living with in exile, lies. Seeing the body of this young woman, uh, Guildeluc understands immediately the situation and mourns the young woman. Two female weasels run into the chapel. When Guildeluc's servants kills one of them, the other one runs out into the forest to find a magical flower that it brings back and places on the dead animal, which springs back to life. Seeing this, Guildeluc takes the flower from the weasel and uses it to, be, to heal Guilladon. The two women re uh, reconcile, and uh, Guildeluc becomes an abbess freeing Elidoc of his marital bonds. Now, most of Marie's lays were translated into Old Norse in the middle of the 13th century. And while no Norse translation of Elidoc survives, the use of this motif of the weasels curing each other uh, uh, suggests or means that the story once circulated in the North. But again, it's not a Germanic motif. And I think that again is significant that Stefan chooses to keep it in his narrative as a part of his general strategy to keep close to the, to the story of Wilson the Saga in the belief that to do so will maximize the effect of the collaborative estrangement that he is aiming for. The remainder of part one deal with Sigurd and Sigurd's bloody revenge with Sigurd, uh, Sigurd, which results in the death of Sigurd, his two new sons, and also of Sigurd, who despite everything chooses to die with her husband. We then follow the events leading to the death of Sinfjord at the hand of Sigurd's first wife, Borghild, Sigurd's subsequent marriage to Herwedis, and then his death at the hands of King Lingwe, who had uh, earlier and unsuccessfully sought the hand of Herodes. Not only does Sigimund leave his wife with child, but he leaves her the broken pieces of the sword he drew from Barnstock, giving instructions for it to be reforged for his son and for it to be given the name Graham. Part two, Sig Sigifried the Valsal, carries the story through Sigifried's apprenticeship in the smithy of Ragan, his meeting with Gundahari, Hagen, and Gudrun, the children of, of uh, Gebica, and his with his wife Grimhild, uh, who is also so Grimhild is a great 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 granddaughter of Lothanotai, who was the younger daughter of um, uh, uh, Kraidema. The idea being that on uh, both his maternal and his paternal side is that uh, uh, Sigifrid is, is descended from daughters of Kraidema way back when. As Siegfried grows up, he obtains his horse Grani, fostered by no less a stallion than, uh, father by no less a stallion than Woden's eight legged Sleipnir. After a great deal of difficulty, the broken sword that belonged to Sigmund is reforged as ground. Siegfried goes north to avenge his father's death on King Lingwe, along with Ragan and his forces. And on the way, uh, well, uh, here we go, Sigmund, Sigmund, This is a, he sees the mountain where, where, uh, uh, where, sorry, the, the mountain where Fadmir guards the treasure that was paid as out of Wehrdil. And this is the 17th century, this is Drakenfels, where I suppose he was supposed to be, but well, I like this one because you can actually, um, work. Oh, all right. But the up there and so on, and it looks almost still as you can see where the dragon would come down to the water. Okay. In, in modern in modern pictures you don't you don't see that aspect of it. It's got trees and everything. Yeah. So uh, um, so this is this is traditionally where where Fafnir was supposed to uh, have hidden his treasure in, in the ancient Roman quarries at the top, so that's what the caves are, uh, so far as that's concerned. Anyway, uh, all of that is, uh, um, uh, he, he sees that. After the army returns victorious from having killed King Inve, Ragan is finally ready to put him 
into motion the plans he has been mulling over for so many generations. Siegfried manages to kill the dragon, but then inadvertently learns that Ragnar intends to kill him and have all the gold to himself. This he prevents by killing Ragnar and loading all the treasure onto Brian. He then goes to search for the woman Sirifa, the Valkyrie asleep in her mountain lair, or at least that's what the birds had told him who had warned him against Ragnar, his treachery. He finds her and learns she had been placed there by Woden for choosing victory for the wrong man in a battle. When they part, he goes, and she goes to her earthly body, which takes the form of the princess Brynichil, and Siegfried returns home, promising to seek the hand of Brynichil in marriage and that of nobody else. While the men in part one had been heroes and had great physical, uh, 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 great physical specimens, they all pale in comparison to Siegfried. What I see here, and even more in Stephen Brundy's Beowulf, uh, was a grand killing. Is the description of exaggerated male physiques under, I suspect, the influence of the portrayal of such heroes in uh, um, DC and Marvel comics, which I'm familiar with, and now we get here actually in a book written about as if there, as if there's some kind of reality to it. But again, in Rheingold, it, it can contrast to, to Beowulf, in my opinion, these descriptions do not get out of hand. The third part of the novel uh, explores the consequences of Siegfried forgetting Sigilinda Brinschel, thanks to a magic potion prepared by Queen Brimhill and marrying Gunderu instead. Furthermore, he now becomes deeply involved in the politics of the Burgundian state. Then in a detail that is not in Vilsugasaga, Bundahari and Hagen help Siegfried hide the great treasure in a secure underground storehouse by the Rhine. Hagen keeps the key on his person. Things get complicated when it's determined to marry Brinchil to Gundihara, the heir to the Burgundian throne. The end result is that Siegfried is killed by his brother-in-law Hagen at the insistence of, of Gudrun, and Brunichild commits suicide after killing Siegfried and uh, uh, Gudrun's uh, little son. Um, so there's blood everywhere. Um, Gudrun is then married off, uh, and then she commits suicide, Brunichild. Gudrun is then married off to Attila, king of the Huns, who is as much interested in the gold possessed by his new wife's late husband as he is in her. Before all is over, Gundahari and Hagen are dead, as are Attila and his two sons with Gudrun, Gudrun is rescued by Hagen's son Nebel, and when they return to Worms, Nebel reveals that his father, suspecting treachery on Attila's part, had entrusted to him the key to the storeroom where Fafnir's tre treasure is hidden. At night, he and Gudrun go to the storehouse and toss all the gold back into the Rhine, where it had come from in the first place. And here, the novel ends. This ending, which is not in Bilsumasad, is a brilliant move which gives the novel a thematic and moral unity, which is not in the original source material. The old English rune poem from the 8th or 9th century ends with the statement, Feof bith frover, fear you will wealth is comfort to everybody. But not all of the time was so sanguine. While he was learning Old English, Stephen may have come across the following sentiment in King Alfred's 9th century translation of the Wittes' De Consolatio and Philosopher, Philosophia. Hey Allah, what say for me Yitzra Wera? Hey Aris, the earth and the devil enough to go. And thou frecht and they with Nisafunda, they air with the hid was and be hallowed with their earth. Alas, in what way are we talking about the man of Etna? Uh, uh, burning like the fires of Etna, the first miser must have been who first began to dig after gold and found that dangerous treasure which before was hidden and concealed in the earth. The 13th century uh, Norwegian rune poem is a little more cautious. It says that uh, wealth causes the discourse of the discord of kinsmen. The 15th century Icelandic rune poem, close in time to Vilsa is even more explicit, coming with the stanza, wealth and the fire of the sea that is gold, and the path of the serpent that's also gold, is the cause of discord among kinsmen. Rheingold exemplifies the wisdom of this statement, which in historical terms is probably another anachronism. 
but one which certainly contributes to giving the novel its modern feel. Anyway, I've scarcely touched and scratched the surface of the richest concern in this extraordinary first novel, and I kind of praise to highly this writing and narrative taking deafness. It's a book I will take the time to read again. I noted that at the beginning of his writing career, Stefan had been very prudently advised not to base his first novel on the old English poem Beowulf. In my academic career at Purdue, I have taught a graduate course on Beowulf in Old English some 14 times. In this course, this course involves reading the entire poem in the original. And so I think that I'm well aware of the many pitfalls any interpretation of the poem involves. 25 years after the publication of Rheingold, a novel of 572 pages appeared under the title, uh, under the Three Little Sisters imprint, uh, with the title, uh, sorry, and this is the edition I'm using, although it appears to be an iUniverse edition from 2010, and maybe one even earlier than that. Uh, some, some of this bibliographic stuff so I haven't quite got to the bottom of yet. Um, the 2010 edition is just, is just called Beowulf, but the one I'm responding to is called Stephen Brunley's Beowulf. All right, as if Stephen were responding to controversies that an early edition of the novel may have stirred up. Now, I should say at the very outset, it is not Sean Hughes's Beowulf. All right, but that's perhaps the way it should be. What I do want to do is to highlight some of the issues the poem raises, how Stefan addresses them, and where, in my opinion, solutions work and where they don't. Keeping in mind that the poem is notorious for providing unnecessary information and for keeping silent when an important things that we need to know. The first problem we face is what kind of poem is it? Uh, it has traditionally been described as an heroic, as an heroic epic, and this seems to be the approach Stefan favored. But if that's the case, it's a very peculiar hero, one that gets him killed at the end of the poem because of his own misjudgment. Not a tragic hero, but rather a, a something of an incompetent one, giving the last part of the poem its elegiac tone as uh, J.R. Tolkien noted. The poem is punctuated by three fights involving Beowulf, first is against Grendel, whom he defeats with pure strength without use of weapons. The second is against Grendel's mother, she's weaker than his son, the poem says so. But she is still able to throw Beowulf to the ground, sit on him, stab him, and if it wasn't for his coat of mail, she would have killed him. Now luckily he's able to see the sword hanging on the wall and take care of matters from there. Um, for the third time, he's tough for the fight against the dragon, uh, one that I would argue that Beowulf himself has provoked. Um, not only does he go to battle in full uniform, but he also employs a massive iron shield, all to no avail. So instead of going from a hero going from victory to victory, we have an early success that is repeated in a diminished manner before the final disaster occurs. If the poem had only stopped or been broken off after the victory uh, uh, with Grendel, uh, it would be great. Right? <clears throat> and so not surprisingly, that part of the poem, of the, of the novel, it, it deals uh, up through Grendel, uh, it is the best part of the book. Stefan spends a great deal of energy imagining what it must be like for Bale as a young boy. Lines 2183 to 2189 suggest that Beowulf was a coal beater or a male Cinderella, a common motif in the Icelandic sagas, especially in those dealing with the heroes of the north before the settlement of Iceland, so called Port Number, so the Norva, among which is Bilsum Basad. Brethel, King of the Yates, fosters Beowulf, his daughter's son, at court. Stefan is very effective in imagining how difficult it must have been for this big lummox of a lad, unloved by his father out of his depth and sophisticated court culture, clumsy in, weapon, in, in weapons drill and wrestling. The only thing that he really uh, uh, excels at and enjoys doing uh, is swimming in the ocean. And he does that every opportunity that he can. Uh, the king's youngest son, Hielak, on the other hand, becomes his supporter and friend. Interesting, uh, then, interesting enough then, Stefan imagines Beowulf dedicating himself not to Odin or Thor, uh, but rather to Freya Inc, better known as Freya, the fertility god who is said to be the founder of the Swedish royal dynasty. These sections are some of the best in the novel, and including in, in this part of the novel, 
there is a scene that was yeah, very close. We, we saw a werewolf initiation scene in the Northmen. All right, and it, it's almost exactly the same as the initiation scene that as, as Stefan imagines Beowulf going to, to see whether there's a werewolf or not. He fails the test. All right, but the the, 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 the what goes on in that initiation scene is very similar to what we see in the movie. Beowulf, his real name is Berki. He's called Bee Wolf because of his passion for honey cakes. He even gets a girlfriend. Uh, I, I know there's a Star, uh, star Trek, um, Star Trek, whatever. There's, a, there's a, a, a scene on the holiday where Beowulf has a significant other called Freya, all right, uh, uh, and, and things go wrong. In that one, uh, it's the one with Jane is kept anyway. Be that as it may, uh, Beowulf is a girlfriend, okay. And uh, um, no less than he, whom he makes to be a Bronte, one of the sub tribes of the Aeds, and stepsister to Brecker, who is one of Beowulf's worst tormentors. In the novel, the swimming contest between Beowulf and Brecker takes place in real time rather than being delayed. Uh, to be delivered as a report at Rock Dust Court. But in the novel, uh, after Brecker and Beowulf are separated, and Beowulf has dealt with the attacks by the sea monsters, he's captured and seduced by Haven Blower. All right, who is one of the nine daughters of Ran, who is the goddess of the sea, and Aya is a giant who's also the god of the sea. Um, as well as being over-muscled, um, Beowulf is oversexed, which I think is out of keeping with the liminal figure like him, uh, uh, which I'll mention a little later on. But here it stands him in good stead until he wants to leave, that is. Try as she might, Heaven Glow cannot prevent his departure. But as he leaves, she lays an injunction on him that he will have no joy in the woman he loves on land and enjoy no other woman in the world. Beowulf comes to land at the uh, so, so swimming this is over. So Beowulf comes to land at the head of the top of Bachnia, up there. And then he has to turn around and walk all the way down to the land of the Yates. Yeah. Um, that takes him two years. And when he arrives out, uh, two years. Breck, on the other hand, had ended up down there, in, in Fort Pommer, and uh, uh, had got back home early, and said that Beowulf was dead. So when Beowulf turns up two years later, Hegd is now married to Hila and expecting their child. Beowulf's journey to Denmark and his defeat of Grendel are well done in the novel, <clears throat> but the central section of the poem is somewhat hastily skipped over. As I mentioned before, Beowulf hardly covers himself in glory with his fight with Grendel's mother, and Rothgar's speeches are just too long. But to do so is to miss some important clues that helps understand the difficult third part of the poem. On line 1769, Rothgar says that he ruled the Danes for 50 years, protecting them from outside incursions until Grendel attacked. The poem's explanation is that Grendel did not like the songs of Christian creation and the fall of Cain, with which the Danes amused themselves in Herod in the evenings. And this is highly credible. Um, Stefan is closer, I think, to what's going on when he suggests that Horka must have built Herod in the wrong place and uh, violated some, uh, some boundary between wilderness and the civilization that allows Grendel to enter Herod but not other parts of, of, of the Danish capital. And maybe that's why on line 142, Grendel is called Horka's Paul thing. But more important is what Horka's reaction to Grendel's depredations are. And what his reaction is, ah, yeah, yeah. Apart from a good deal of hand wringing, he does absolutely nothing. This was a real problem for scholars until well into the middle of the 20th century, and it still bothers some readers. Right. Rothko will not prevent it, will not prevent any of his men who wish to, to try and kill Grendel. His position is made clear, as he explains to Beowulf on line 478 uh, um, to 479, God is easily able to restrain the deeds of the evildoer. What Rathka seems to be saying is not that God will directly intervene in this matter, but that when he is ready, he will send an agent, maybe somebody like you, Beowulf, to 
take care of matters. My job is just be patient. Uh, his retainers agree with him. Because when Baal had been praised to the skies for having killed Grendel, the poem's narrator comments, comments that uh, the Danish retainers did not in any way find fault with their friendly Lord Hrothgar, but they considered his conduct to be that of a good king. The comment that was gold king had been used once before in the poem in line 11 to praise the reign of Shilshaving, who had compelled all of, his, all of the surrounding nations to pay tribute to him. It will be used one more time in the poem, but not applied to Baal. Roughly the first half of the novel then is directed devoted to events leading up to the battle with Grendel. Stefan Venture's an interesting plot twist, but unfortunately he does very little with it because it seems to me an idea that has a lot of potential. Grendel is a semi-aquatic creature living in the mirror with his mother, but he also has access to the open ocean. And there he encounters Heaven Glow, and he wants to have an affair with her, but she's not interested because she's still mourning for Beowulf whom it appears had now largely lost his early interest in swimming. In the poem, <clears throat> lines 20, 2359 to 2363, Beowulf returns to Yetland from the disastrous <clears throat> adventure in Frisia, in which he elect is killed by swimming uh, uh, alone with 30 coats of mail. In the novel, he takes a boat. The second half of the novel deals with politics, <clears throat> or at least politics is defined by Karl von Clausewitz. War is simply the continuation of political intercourse with the addition of other means. The last part of the poem deals with ancient, an ancient treasure, a guardian dragon, stealing a cup from a horde, the dragon's revenge, Beowulf's death, and the disastrous consequences of all this, all this. Scattered among the narrative are various enigmatic passages dealing with a long-standing conflict between the Yets and the Swedes. Stefan basically puts the dragon to one side and fleshes out the various stages of the conflict in exhaustive detail with help from some other sources like the Fort Nava Saga, Rolf Saga, Krater. When Beowulf was still a young man at Kretel's court, disaster strikes. Hera Bale, Kretel's eldest son, is killed in a hunting accident by his younger brother, Hatkin. Kretel dies of grief and it appears the Swedes, sensing an opportunity, begin to attack Yeats' territory. <coughs> In revenge, the Yeats attack Uppsala <coughs> and capture King Alcongathel's queen. The Swedes overtake the Yeats at a place called Ravenswood, kill Hatkin and rescue the queen. The Yeats, under the new King Kielat, counterattack and Alcongathel is killed. His son, Othra, becomes king and things quiet down for a while. Then Kielat gets himself killed in Frisia. Uh, Beowulf refuses his office, uh, offer of the throne, pledging himself to support Hielach's young son, Hadred, as king. Something happens in Sweden. Onela, Othra's brother, becomes king. It is not clear what happens to Othra, but so far as the Beowulf poet is concerned, the transfer of power is legitimate. And Othra's two sons, Anne Mund and Edgils, are referred to other rebels who cause trouble. So here, we, here we've got Yates. Dane, Swedes, uh, <coughs> rebels who cause trouble for the Yates by seeking sanctuary from Hadred. Onala attacks the Yates. Both Hadred and Anmon are killed, and Onala permits Beowulf to rule. The Beowulf poet goes out of his way to. All on the best of kings of Sweden. And he permits Beowulf to rule, and in doing so, he, Onala, was a good king. Not Beowulf, Onala is a good king. Now, what's exactly behind this? It's possible. It's possible because this, you have to put, well, we've put in a word that doesn't exist in the manuscript. It's possible that. Uh, Onela is Rothgar's brother in law. All right. So but be that as it may. However, at some later date, 
Ed deals with the help of the Yeds, and that presumably means Beowulf, overthrows Onala to presumably become king. It doesn't say anything more. Then the poem says nothing more for the next for about the next 50 years, during which Beowulf is king. But the end of the poem, people are clearly afraid that the Swedes are coming and in force and soon. Stefan will have none of this. Onan is a tyrant and a usurper, and Beowulf becomes king of the years without permission from anybody. And numerous new characters are introduced, and the heroic Yates push back the Swedes to enjoy a long time of peace under King Beowulf. Then a thief takes at the dragon's hoard. Beowulf fights the dragon and dies in heroic death. As in, uh, as in the poem, this is entire as in the poem, this this instance is entirely unmotivated. All right. Um, but this dragon business has to be dealt with somehow. All right. Anyway, he dies a heroic death. Wiglaf takes over as king and prepares an heroic defense of Yetland against the overweening Swedes. End of novel. <clears throat> the whole episode with the dragon in the novel appears to me anyway rushed, as if the author was embarrassed that this was something he had to deal with. Not so the poem. But the poem leaves far too many questions unanswered and unaddressed. Why is the treasure enchanted? It says so in line 3052. Who is the dragon? Is he a human being? Some kind of fafti? What exactly is Beowulf's role in the plundering of the horde? It's clear he's had his eyes on it. Why is it that the first thing the dragon does after missing the cup is come out and burn Beowulf's hall to the ground? And let us not forget what happened earlier in the poem. After ruling for 50 years, Hrothgar does something that, invo that evokes the rage of Grendel. What does he do? Nothing. He waits for God to deal with it, and then uh, as and when he sees fit. After ruling 50 years, Beowulf appears to do something, in my opinion, to evoke the rage of the dragon. What does he do about it? He raises out the feast to face the creature in full armor with a gigantic iron shield, none of which does him any good, and he is promptly killed. Rothgar was a good king. He received tribute from the neighboring kingdoms and, in, and attended the future by a genuine heir and a spare. Beowulf seems to have kept the neighboring kingdoms at bay, but there's no indication they pay him tribute. Also, his apparent role in the overthrowing the Swedish king by whose grace he came to rule is perhaps accommodated by his saying, uh, I, for my part, um, did not swear many oaths unjustly, all right? I did not swear any oaths, fairly, many oaths. And so one of the oaths he must have sworn unjustly was when he turned against Onan, but be that simple. And then Beowulf realizes that he doesn't have a son. Excuse me, Beowulf, what have you been doing for the last 50 years? Huh? And even if you cannot have a son of your own, there's always fosterage and adoption. Stefan accounts for this lapse as being the result of uh, Havenglau's curse. Plus, he, was, he once crushed a woman to death in Frisia while making love to her. And then there has delicate feelings for him. He never stops loving her, but refused to allow his divorce Hela when he returns back from Finnmark. Nor would he marry her after the death of Hela in his own mind to protect her. I'm sorry, but shades of a Harlequin melodrama are not very satisfactory in my mind. It's more likely that his role as a liminal character who can move with ease between this world and the next comes with a certain cost in terms of a lack of potency and shrunken genitals, like a bodybuilder on anabolic steroids. This is certainly the case for Greta Ausmundersen, who is a 13th century reflex of the Babel figure. And I would suggest the lack of children points to something similar being the case for Beowulf as well. That still doesn't explain why he doesn't take a foster son. Then there's his role in awakening the dragon. Apparently everybody knows about the treasure and that it is enchanted and it can only be released by God. But Beowulf refuses to be dissuaded. As Wiglaf grimly reports, a high price has to be paid for his stubbornness. Often many and all must suffer misery because of a single person's will. Rumi reports a high price had to be paid for stubbornness. And in one of his dying speeches, Beowulf praises God for he's been able to leave behind such a treasure with which to enrich his people. 
And what does grateful people do immediately upon Beowulf's death? They rebury the treasure in the ground so that it remains till this day in the earth as useless as it was before. Stephen had seen in Wilson Masada the theme of the corrosive view of riches, that the corrosive view of riches was a theme upon which he constructed his novel while remaining close to his source materials. That there is a similar theme in the last part of the film Beowulf is something he chose to overlook. Also, he does not seem to be comfortable with the element of fatalistic acquiescence, which the author of Beowulf finds so praiseworthy in Hrothka and lacking in Beowulf. He wants to present the modern world with the portrait of an ancient northern warrior hero that is more in line with the sentiment at the end of Tennyson's poem Ulysses, first published in uh, 1842. We are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven. That which we are, we are. Equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. However, in order to achieve this, he has to tell the story in such a way that it contradicts the source material, and this I do not find very helpful, as it simplifies and obscures the, com the complexities of the poem. And there may be something to the story of Baal as an indifferent or negligent uh, ruler. We don't find out, for example, why Beowulf thinks his people are so desperate in need of a capital infusion of gold. There are three... That's... But this gold for my people, people say, forget it. <laughs> so there are the ads and they're the sweets. There are three, oh, let's go back here. There are three major peoples named in the poem Beowulf. The Danes, yeah, I can find Denmark, still on the map. The Swedes, Sweden too is no problem. Gates, never heard of them. Can't find them on the map. More research will show that the name, that, that the name does remain actually in the two Swedish provinces of uh, uh, West of Gotland and East of Gotland. More states. The historical evidence is more difficult to interpret, but some argue that the demise of Gates as an independent people took place between the 5th and the 9th century, sort of in the time Beowulf was set. Although the awareness of being a Goit lasted much longer. Also interesting is the fact that the Goits were much more actively Christian than the Swedes, where large segments of the population held out against conversion until the 12th century. So Stephen Grundy's Beowulf, version of Beowulf is not Sean Hughes' version of Beowulf. That doesn't mean it cannot be read and enjoyed. In fact, some of the suggested answers to questions that are in the poem are positively ingenious and thought-provoking. For example, it's a considerable amount of space is given to a backstory on Rothgar's wife, Welther. And I like the suggestion that Beowulf was in love and betrothed to Hig. This is right up there with uh, Neil Gaiman's screenplay from the 2006 uh, movie Beowulf, which presents Grendel as Hrothgar's son and makes the dragon uh, Beowulf sung by Grendel's mother. Uh, it, although this act has uh, rendered Beowulf sterile subsequently uh, it, with earthly women, uh, and he has no children, even though he has a wife and a mistress. So I introduced Stephen Brandy at the beginning of this lecture as a gifted writer. He is that and more, a master storyteller as well. And even though I've not always agreed with the narrative decisions he made, particularly in Stephen Brandy's Beowulf, that does make them any the less provocative and challenging, nor the novel any the less worth reading. And there are other novels in addition. Attila's Treasure from 1996 delves deeper into the character of Hagen. Gilgamesh, 1999, tells the story of the ancient Mesopotamian team in Demigod. The trilogy he wrote with his wife, Melody Lamond, Falcon's Flight, Eagle and Falcon, and Falcon's Night, available in print only in German translation and in English as an ebook. Uh, Beowulf, whenever that is written, and most recently, Valkyrie, a new, in which a neo pagan rock star deals with unrequited love and business, unfinished business from a previous existence. So it's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to give the first Stephen Grundy medieval lecture. Um, his novels uh, deserve reading and rereading. There's so much to say about each of them that they will engage and stimulate readers and scholars, I think, for a long time to come. Thank you very much. Thank you.